Hello and welcome to Ask Echometer. My name is Carrie Ann Taylor, and along with myself from Echometer today, we have Gustavo Fernandez, who is going to run the chat and our Q&A session. We also have Ken Skinner, Dieter Becker, Tony Podio, and Lynn Rowland, who will be presenting today. We have an Ask Echometer webpage that is accessible from our echometer.com website. So you can go there right now if you'd like and download the session 18 PDF documentation bundle. And that bundle contains a PDF of today's presentation as well as 10 technical papers that are referenced in today's session. Then right next to that PDF bundle link is a link to download the TAM examples that Lynn is going to use today. So if you don't already have the TAM software installed on your computer, you can download it from the software page on the website. And there's a link from the home page directly to the TAM 1.7 install. We're also going to discuss and demonstrate the Echometer Gas Separator Simulator. So if you don't already have that software, there's a link titled Gas Separator Simulator Software. And it's a small program and a quick install if you want to go grab that as well. Today's session addresses incomplete pump fillage due to gas interference. And the presentation is titled Downhole Gas Separators Selection Design Performance. So Lynn, I will turn it over to you now. Thank you, Carrie Ann. Uh, this presentation will be a little bit longer than normal because we'll talk about gas separation in wells that are vertical or if your pump is set above the kickoff point and then we'll talk somewhat briefly about gas separators that are in uh, separation below the kickoff point and and then we'll talk about we'll, we'll just demonstrate some example we'll answer some questions and we'll also uh, show the gas separator simulator and go through a couple of workbook workbook examples on that echometer builds and sells and supports a portable uh, well analyzer system, both wireless and wired. And sometimes people ask, why do you have gas separators? And what I usually say is, well, you know, the, the owner of the company is named Jim McCoy. And he used to go out and fly his Cessna plane out to the field and deliver equipment to individual operators. And they would go out to the well and use the equipment. And Jim would turn to the operator and say, you know, your, your well has a gas interference problem. You have incomplete pump fillage due to gas interference. He, and then he would say something like, you know you need to have a gas separator. And almost always the operator would say, well, I've got a gas separator in this well. It's a, it's a perforated sub, a mud anchor, and a joint of tubing. And Jim would say, well, it's not working. Your pump is, your pump is full of gas. So, so Jim, being the kind of engineer he is, when he sees a problem, he wants to solve it. And so we have written papers on this topic, even probably before 1998. But that's this is the first paper I was involved with, and we've we've had several, not several, many many papers. And so Carrie, I mentioned that there's 10 papers about gas separators that we've written over the last 10 years that are primarily from the short course. And I'll reference another six papers that Dr. Po, Dr. Uh, Podio uh, uh, provided through. Uh, SPE. So there's quite a few papers available and there's other papers we'll talk about. So there's a lot of technology, a lot of research that we've done, a lot of research that we've funded over the last uh, 20 years or more. All right. So the idea is that if you go to a, a rod pumping well, and we're primarily talking about gas separators for suck rod pumping wells, um, and the pump is not full of liquid, and the fluid levels above the pump, then we talked about this in a previous session. That's, that's a, a way to identify likely that the well has a gas interference problem. And so when you have gas in your pump, then your, your production rate is significant, significantly reduced. Your drawdown is not done. You have a higher fluid level. And the 
because the pump is not full. And we also talked about incomplete pump fillers. We gave an example of increased failure rates. So you have increased failures, and you also have, uh, you know, less efficiency. Now the efficiency is due to um, not only the producing efficiency is low on the well because you have a high fluid, we're not drawing the well down, but the power efficiency is low because you're um, wasting a lot of power compressing gas. So that's even inefficient. And then the failures cause you to have a high operating cost, and that's inefficient operating in the field because you're having a lot of problems due to gas interference. So that's kind of the little little background that we're going to talk about. And the way you try to address this problem is you try to install in, in your well a separator, dental gas separator that's designed and sized uh, for the for the for the for the capacity of your pump, so that the separator has a capacity that exceeds the pump displacement, the net pump displacement for your for your well. And there's a good reference right there about how the how the incomplete pump, pump fillage um, results in a much higher failure rate. So you can, if you're interested, that paper is on the memory state, or not the memory state, but on the on the, the PDF that you can download. Uh, Dr. Podio has done a lot of research at the University of Texas, and these are pictures of the separator, a PVC or, or a plexiglass separator inside the petroleum department. And what you see here, this is a dental gas separator. Out of, made out of PVC, uh, clear clear plexiglass, and this is the outside of the casing, and this is the outside of the gas separator, and this is the dip tube inside the gas separator, and liquid is flowing between the the ID of the gas separator and the OD of the dip tube, and it's flowing down at a velocity of about five inches per second, and we don't see any gas bubbles here at all. Well, why don't we see any gas bubbles? Because in a mixture of water and air, the gas bubble typically rises. A common gas bubble size will rise at about six inches per second. So if, as long as you maintain a velocity of flow of liquid through your pump less than the gas bubble rise, then, then you won't have any gas in your pump. And so in this, in this well, uh, 243 barrels a day, results in uh, velocity here between the dip tube and the gas and the, and the idea of the barrel of about five inches per second. Now, if you get to six inches per second, in this case right here, about 275 barrels a day, then you start to see gas bubbles at the intake of the dip tube, which means there's going to be gas inside your pump. And so any, any uh, rate for water and air in a water and air system greater than six inches per second of the velocity of liquid between the ID of the separator barrel and the OD of the dip tube is going to be is going to result in free gas being pulled into your pump and reducing the efficiency of your system. Now this is a video um, at the University of Texas that Dr. Podio uh, re recorded, and you can see here that the you can see that the, there's a lot of gas bubbles, but the gas bubbles aren't being carried between the this area between the dip tube and this idea of the separator barrel into the dip tube, and so the pump would be full liquid. Now here is at the 420 barrels a day, and we've exceeded the gas bubble rise. And if you look closely, you in fact this is a mirror image on the back. You can see that the gas is on the back is being pulled into the dip tube, and you can see here it's being pulled into the dip tube, and so we're so the the separator in effect is failing. Why? Because we're exceeding the gas bubble rise velocity and the gas is getting pulled by the liquid velocity into the dip tube into the pump. Now this is uh, an animation, not animation, but also video. And what this is to show is that if you can somehow coalesce the gas bubbles, then you can see the big bubbles have a, have a, a can rise up against uh, a uh, have a higher rise velocity as, as they get coalesced. And so this is a, a test just to show that when you have large bubbles, that the large bubbles can can uh, fight through the liquid even if there's uh, gas bubbles present. Now this, this video is to show intermittent pumping. And what it shows is that on a suck rod lift, the pumping's intermittent because when the, the standing valve is open, gas bubbles get pulled into the dip tube 
And then when the same valve is closed during the downstroke, then the gas bubbles can escape from inside the separator. And this is kind of the, this we, we use this concept or this video here uh, as the as the background for the gas separator simulator. So the gas bubble rise, the uh, velocity of the gas bubble, the dimensions, the area, the liquid flow, flow rates, the strokes per minute, all have an impact on the performance of your gas separator. And we'll talk about that more. All right. Now, if you were to think about a vertical well, and you have perforations in the well, and you have a dead space below the purse, we, we call this a rat hole, where there's no liquid entry or no gas entry, then we could assume that the deepest point that gas can enter the well bore would be at this bottom perf. Likely the higher perfs would more likely have gas flowing in liquid at the bottom, but you could have gas flowing in the bottom perfs. So if you were to set your tubing, your pump intake, below the bottom perf, then you have uh, a capacity for a high, a high area here, a large area between the OD of the tubing and the ID of the casing. Now, how do you how do you calculate or determine the capacity of setting your tubing below your bottom perf in a vertical well? <coughs> well, if you take um, six inches per second and you calculate the velocity of six inches per second through one square inch of area, then that's equal to a flow rate of about 50 barrels a day. So 50 barrels a day per, per square inch of area between the dip tube OD and the, and the casing wall ID uh, gives you the capacity of the uh, sep gas separation if you set your tubing uh, intake below the perforations, which is, which is probably the most efficient method of gas separation. If you have this uh, rat hole in your well, if you have uh, a space below the bottom perf where you can set your intake. Now, that doesn't work in a horizontal well because typically the perforations are along the horizontal and you really can't set your uh, tubing below the bottom perf because the perfs are at the bottom. Now, that would be casing and tubing. And if you have to set your pump, above the perforations, then you can build your own rat hole, in effect, by making a size of the separator smaller than your casing, and you set that, that the separator above your perforations where the fluid entry zone is, and then you have a dip tube inside this separator, and you calculate the area that the, the capacity of the separator by determining the square inches of area between the OD of the dip tube and the ID of the separator ID times 50 gives you an approximate estimate of the separator capacity to separate um, the gas and liquid as long as you're in a, a water and air environment. Now, the gas bubble size, what we've seen is that when you have this normal flow, the gas bubble size is pretty small, about an eighth of an inch in diameter, and that's pretty typical to maybe a quarter inch in diameter. But if you have a lot of turbulence and a lot of, a lot of sharp edges, then you have pressure drops at those sharp edges and turbulence and high flow rates that tend to make smaller bubbles and the smaller bubbles will tend to have a, a slower rise velocity. So one of the key points about designing a gas separator is you want a large flow area, you want smoothed corners, and you don't want sharp edges to cause a sudden pressure drop where you might start to break out uh, the gas or, or create a turbulence that's going to create small bubble, bubbles that will have a much slower rise velocity. Now this is a chart that shows the concept of gas bubble versus gas bubble rise, the size versus the rise. And so if you look, you can see here's the equivalent diameter, and here's the rise velocity in water and air. And we typically would like to have the bigger bubbles, but if we have a little tiny bubble, then little tiny bubbles are going to rise fairly slow. But the bigger bubbles, an eighth of an inch uh, diameter or larger, will typically 
uh, float around six inches per second or so. And this is just a picture again of the dip tube in the uh, test facility that Dr. Podio built. You can see here that the separator is failing as the gas bubbles enter the dip tube. The capacity of the separator is being exceeded by the liquid flow rate through the gas separator. Now, so one rule of thumb is don't flow the liquid faster than the gas bubble rise or you'll have gas in your pump. The other rule of thumb for gas separator design is don't flow the gas on the outside of the separator too fast and create a mixture that's called a mist. And that mixture, when it becomes a mist, usually occurs around the gas velocity of what we call critical gas velocity rate. So if you exceed critical rate, then the gas is going to uh, mist the liquid and it's going to take a long time to separate the, the gas and the liquid because now they're a common mist, somewhat stable due to the high gas velocity. So what you need to do is not make this area infinitely small because that's going to make the gas velocity infinitely high. Well, why would you make this wall, this area small? Because you want to make the area inside the separator large so that the liquid velocity will be low. So there's a conflict. There's a conflict when you design a gas separator between the ID, the internal size of the separator, and the external space on the outside. If you make this the space too small, then you get a turbulence and create a mist. If you make this space too small in here, the liquid velocity is too high and the liquid carries the gas into the separator. So it's a balance. Usually the rule of thumb we say is make the separator size no more than 80% of the size of the casing annulus. Don't exceed that or you'll probably make it too easy to create a mist. Now this is some research that Dr. Podio did. This was published in November of 2009. And what this is showing along the bottom, it's showing the gas velocity. And it's showing different liquid flow rates inside the gas separator. And we're seeing kind of what we'd expect. At a low li liquid rate, you're not exceeding, in a vertical well, you're not exceeding the separator capacity. And so the liquid fillage is almost 100%. But as you increase the liquid rate here above the, the separator capacity, then you start to exceed inside the separator six inches per second. And now we start to lose efficiency and you start to pull in, pull in gas. This is about 10 feet per second right here. And so we're starting to, starting to pull in gas into the pump because now we've exceeded the separator capacity. If you ex exceed it a lot, then as, a, as the velocity increases or the area is decreasing, then the separator capacity even drops more due to a high liquid velocity. But sometimes people say, what about running our separator, our gravity separator, below the kickoff point? And so if the separator is inclined, you're going to increase the separation efficiency because the gas bubbles will run along the high side of the casing if the separator is resting on the low side of the casing. So this data shows that it probably helps a little bit to have the separator offset not run um, above an anchor, but below the anchor to be anchor, so it can lean on the low side of the casing wall, or if you have a horizontal well, along the deep below the kickoff point along the deviation deviated side of the well bore. So when someone asks the question, what's the best the best gas separator? Then the best gas separator that you can have in your well is one that is placed below the entry point of the gas. So you want to try to set your separator below the entry point. Now horizontal wells have made this almost impossible. So some companies have come back in and re-entered their well at the kickoff point and, and drilled into the below the kickoff point 
and created a sump. And what they found was, and when they did that, then the high gas flow rate by the sump often would starve the pump. So that didn't work even if you had the horizontal well. So this is typically done in vertical wells where you have some space below the bottom perfs, a dead zone uh, where there's no inflow, and you can set your intake um, uh, below the below the bottom bottom perforations. This is at least eight feet. That's 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 a pretty good distance. Now, if you use this natural gas separator, which is casing wall ID and the tubing OD, then if you have seven inch casing and 10 cent inches tubing, then you have a capacity inches times 50 of about 1,200 barrels a day. That's that's a really high capacity for a suck rod pump. If you have five and a half inch casing and two and seven inch tubing. Uh, then this area between the 5.5 ID and the 2 and inch OD times 50 gives you about 580 barrels per day of capacity, of separation capacity. Now once you start to get in a smaller size casing, 4.5 and, and 2 and 3 inch tubing, then you start to get restricted rate below your perforations of 420 barrels a day. So as the casing size gets smaller, so the capacity is reduced. Now, so when Jim would say, hey, you need a gas separator, the operator would say, you know, we got one. We've got a gas separator in well. And Jim would say, well, what, what do you have? And he said, well, we've got a four-foot perforated sub. We have a sub hooked to the C nipple with a collar, and then a tubing joint attached to the four-foot sub. We have a mud anchor, which is like a, called a dip tube, 12 foot long. It runs, it's on, on the insert pump and it goes down past to this perforated sub into a joint of tubing that's that's uh, orange peeled on the bottom which means they close it off or you could put a collar and a, and a bull plug on the bottom to seal it off and Jim would say well there's something wrong because this separator isn't keeping the gas out of your pump well why well one reason is that the area between the dip tube and the the Perforated sub is, can be restricted. It's not much area in a two and three inch tubing, depending on the OD of the dip tube. Um, the collars, the collars, tend to hold the separator off of the casing wall, and that means that when the gas is flowing by the separator, you'd like to have the liquid fall into the pump and not be contacting the gas bubbles. But when you run a collar and the collar holds the separator, this perforated sub off of the wall, then it's out there where the gas may be. So there's, there's several reasons. So this is a table of that 1998 paper that talks about the capacity, what we call a, a poor boy gas separator. Now, when we say poor boy, it means an inexpensive one. It means you build it with materials available on the lease. But when you build one with materials on the lease, and you build it so that it has a two and three per freight sub and an inch or an inch and a quarter dip tube, and you only have 51 barrels a day or one square inch of area, it's not only a poor boy gas separator, which is low cost, it's a poor performing gas separator. So when I think of poor boy, I think of poor performing because often, often, the suck rod pump, pump displacement exceeds 51 barrels a day or even exceeds 94 barrels a day. And really what's happening when you say, send me a four foot perforated sub, you in effect say, I promise I want to operate my suck by pump if there's gas present, more than 94 barrels a day if I'm using an inch dip tube, or if I'm using an inch and a quarter dip tube, then I'm not gonna operate my pump with a displacement more than 51 barrels a day. And that's discussed in this paper right here. Now, when we talked about <laughs> The gas bubble rise, um, about, oh, probably about five or six years ago, we were looking at the idea of the video, and we started calculating the gas bubble rise and showing the effect of gas bubbles, and we did a little animation on that, and Jim decided, you know, I think I'm going to have the programmers make this animation so that they can, so operators can see how the gas bubble rise works, and so here I've got this poor boy gas separator in my well. And it's got a dip tube in it that's an inch, 1.05 uh, 
ID and 1.315 OD that gives me a 96 barrel a day separation capacity. And if I'm pumping 96 barrels a day, at the very end of the downstroke, all this gas gets out of this gets out of the separator. And so this separator works as long as I've got water and air. And the gas will rise at six inches per second. Now, if I'm running a suck rod pump that has a pump displacement of 120 barrels a day, notice here on the downstroke that these gas bubbles don't get out. And in effect, they're trapped inside the separator. And after a few strokes, this will be the third stroke, then the gas gets pulled in the suck rod pump. And the sec separator capacity has been exceeded by the net pump displacement of the suck rod pump. And so the animation that shows the bubbles, the flow, is all to scale based on this the length of the dip tube. It's all to scale. So it's, it's, it's to scale vertically and it's to, it's to scale horizontally based on the OD of, this, of the dip tube chamber. So it's showing, it's showing you what would happen if you're pumping at six strokes a minute with 120 barrels a day capacity and you have a gas bubble rise of six inches per second. So that's 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 pretty interesting. Now, where did the concept of improved performance of four boil gas separators come from? Well, the, the concept's been around for a while, and people would start saying, "Well, you need to have a bigger volume down here." And the bigger the volume, the more they would say you could separate more gas from liquid. But the real consideration that we feel is, is, is the velocity of the fluid flowing between the dip tube and OD and the separator ID. So if you make it bigger but still make this area here small, you're still going to have a problem because your gas and liquid won't separate. The liquid flow between the dip tube and the ID of the barrel will carry the gas into, into the, the dip tube, into the pump based on the velocity of the liquid between the ID of the separator and the OD of the dip tube. Now, so what did Echometer do to improve the separator design? Well, in the 1998 paper we talked about making a separator that has a large area. Well, how do you make a separator have a large area when you're restricted by your casing size? Well, the collar size, the OD of the collar, is going into the well based on connecting the tubing joints. So if you can make your separator the OD of the collar, tubing collar, then that would be the maximum size a person would want to run in the well because if they're, they're running their collars in the well already, they wouldn't have any concern about running a collar size gas separator. So the, one of the things that we did is we made the OD of the separator the OD of a collar. And then to make the capacity higher, we make the wall thin, an eighth of an inch thick wall. Well, that's not a good idea because you pull on it, you're going to pull it apart. It's not very strong. Well, that's correct. So you always want to run the collar size, collar size separator below the tubing anchor. It won't be pulled in two by uh, being attached above the, the tubing anchor. Um, what else? What else do you need to think about? Well, we, we wanted to make big ports. Why big ports? In fact, we did a study with Texas University of Texas, and we studied the port design, and we found that the holes need to be large and, and have smooth corners because we don't want pressure drop. The long, narrow slots appear to have a slightly better performance, but we didn't change the design because we want our separator to lean up against the casing wall and pull the liquid off the casing wall, and we didn't feel like this, the narrow slots would have improved the performance of our separators. And so the rule that we have is that if you run a collar size separator, then it needs to be at least two tubing joints away from the tubing anchor so that it'll lean against the, at the casing wall. But if you were to stick a separator out in the center of the well bore, you might want to consider uh, narrow, narrow slots. All right, so that's that slide. Now, if you look at the paper in 1998, we published in that paper different capacities for the collar size separator. And these are 
basically the maximum capacity you can have for a gas separator inside uh, for these tubing sizes. If you use these tubing collar sizes, this would be the outside diameter based on the collar size. These would be the maximum capacities. So these are the capacities of the separator based on a collar size separator, thin walled, large ports against the side of the casing wall. Now, <clears throat> can you install a four and a half inch separator that has an OD of 5.5 inches inside four and a half inch tubing? Four inch casing. No, you can't because it's too big, the OD is too big. So the casing in the well limits the size of the separator that you can install in the well. <clears throat> how do you know how efficient your separator is? Well, you can you can go to the well and run a dynamometer card and shoot a fluid level. And the fluid level, we measure the casing pressure buildup rate, and that calculates the annular gas flow rate and the percent liquid. We look at a, a pump card, we can see the pump fillage and the effective plunger travel when the trailing valve opens. And if we compare the, for the effective plunger travel opens, let's look right here. If we compare this distance right here when the trailing valve is open on the downstroke to the total stroke, that ratio is called the effective plunger stroke or the average pump fillage. So if you look at their pump card and you see the pump card has a pump fillage of 64% and your fluid level shot says liquids on the outside of the pump has 19% liquid, then you would be to the right of this one-to-one -one line and your separator, gas separator, is increasing the liquid inside the pump compared to the liquid on the outside of the pump based on a fluid level shot. But if you're on the left side of this of this line, then your separator is failing when the efficiency on the outside efficiency of your pump is less than the liquid percent on the outside. So this is this is if you're to the left of this line, your separator is failing. If you're right, it's working okay. Now this is a paper that we did. Uh, Kim went up to North Dakota and visit uh, uh, Slonson Field and took data on 10 different wells and looked at the, the percent liquid from fluid level shots and looked at the um, percent pump fillage on the outside and we have an example look at after, the, after we get through this presentation about the Slonson well and it's this, it's this well number 2-28 right here and we'll look at the fluid level percent liquid and we'll look at the, the uh, percent pump fillage based on the downhole pump card. And it's also in a paper that we wrote, uh, Gas Separate Performance, and it was published um, in 2013. Now this is an interesting slide and you wouldn't think it would belong in a gas separator presentation. But this was a, a problem we encountered in some vertical wells near Midland called Wolfberry wells. And so the Wolfberry wells have a fair, fairly long perforated interval, anywhere from a thousand foot of perforations to three thousand foot of perforations. And some of the perforations produce solids. And so the operator tends to want to set the tubing anchor at the top of all the perfs. And so this picture is a picture that Dr. Podio drew. And I said, oh, this can't be right. And Tony said, well, sure, look, sure is acting like this. And I said, this can't be right. And Dr. Podio would say, well, it sure looks like acting like this. And Jim would say, well, it's acting like this. And so what do we do? Well, let me see if I can explain this a little bit more. This picture shows that there's a gassy fluid column above the tubing anchor. And it shows that down below the tubing anchor, there's gas. And this gassy fluid column is resting on the tubing anchor, which is restricting the flow of fluids from the reservoir because it's putting pressure, that pressure right there on the formation below, below the tubing anchor. Now, so what do we do? Well, to prove that there was a problem, Ken went to this well and he, and he walked through the rattlesnakes. I think he did. Maybe, maybe he saw a rattlesnake there or two. 
and he would he would do a dynamometer on the well after the well been turned off for for ten minutes and the well would turn on and immediately pump full strokes for ten for ten strokes or eight strokes and then it would pump off and be completely full of gas and so the, the separator would work but there's no liquid at the pump so in this case the separator is not failing it would work but there's no liquid to produce so the liquid provided by the reservoir is restricted by inflow due to high pressure caused by this tall gassy fluid level. So here is the data that Ken collected on this well and the triangles are the dist distance to the top of the liquid and the circles is the casing pressure and after he verified there was a gassy fluid level above the pump and the pump would only pump for eight strokes and not be full then he, he closed the casing valve and let the pressure start to build up and here's the pressure building up over time this is the last time in minutes and then right here in the middle of the night at 2.21 a.m. this fluid level above the, the liquid above the pump had been pushed down the tube anchor and right there if Ken was there at 2.21 a.m. in the morning he would see the next shot would be down at the pump and the space of almost over over a thousand foot of wellbore below the tubing anchor be filled with gas and so there's a good paper on the memory stick that memory, memory, memory stick that echometer wrote um, that talks about this condition and how, how do you solve this problem because the operator said we will never run a tubing anchor below the perforations because we don't want to stick our anchor we've done that before we won't do that we want to put the anchor above our formation because we don't want solids falling on the anchor. Hmm, hard problem. So here's here's the data, and this is the well, 3104. And if you look, you see one, two, three, four, five, about eight strokes, and then the then the then the strokes here. These are each individual strokes, change from a full pump, which these are full pumps, to completely pumped off, which is no inflow in a short time and then it stays like this for the rest of the strokes so so what do you do well, so we've discussed this in this paper that tubing anchors can restrict flow well one of the things you can consider doing is don't run anchors that are large you can run a hydraulic anchor or a low profile tubing anchor and and open up the casing annulus to more flow the other thing is that you can change how you set your tubing anchor or you can possibly run a gas separator above above the tubing anchor well I've already said you can't do that because of because the wall is thin so we thought well let's make a heavy wall to gas separator that would work above the tubing anchor and so this is the this is a the heavy wall gas separator instead of a quarter inch thick here it's got uh, instead of an eighth of inch thick wall it's got a quarter inch thick walls and so now we can pull tension on the tubing anchor and it won't pull in two so that's the advantage of the heavy wall tubing anchor. You can set it above the you can set heavy wall gas separator can be set above the tubing anchor and you can pull it in tension. Now, so this would be where you set your, your so here's our perforations, a long perforated interval in this in this formation, which a lot of formations have now long perforated intervals. You would set if you couldn't set the thin walled uh, anchor below the gas separator below the packer or below the tubing anchor. Then you want to set it above where the gas isn't being trapped. You'd use a heavy wall gas separator. The other option is, which is which is what the operator decided to do, was run a t on and off tool in his rat hole below all the perforations, and then a perforated sub above the on and off tool, and then he would he would set his pump and pull his, his pump in tension. And his tubing anchor would be not present. He wouldn't have he wouldn't have a gas separator. So the tubing anchor would be uh, an on-off tool now, which would not be the tubing anchor just be an on-off tool that you could pull tension on. So you 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 wouldn't have a tubing anchor in this case. You'd have an on-off tool which would be set. You'd have a perforated sub right here, and then you'd have your pump, and your pump would be set below the perfs, and that's that allowed them to draw the fluid level down. Uh, produce a well with a pump-off controller 
and maintain normal normal operations like they would typically do in a well. But it wasn't the separator was failing, it was the positioning of the tubing anchor in the well bore that restricted the annular gas flow. <coughs> now, this well is a well in Louisiana and the operator called me, a good friend of mine, and Ronnie would say, hey Lynn, what's wrong with my well? And I'd say, hey Ronnie, you got gas interference. And I said, look, there's almost no gas flowing up the casing, and you have no production to the surface, there's pumps full of gas, it's not working very well. I said, you need to run a, a properly sized gas separator in this well. He said, well, we, this well's 10,000 foot deep, we're not going to pull this well, just run a separator in it. I said, well, that's what's wrong. And so it was failing. And every time I make a recommendation, he said, we just can't do that. And so after questioning back and forth, discussing about six months, um, he finally ran the, the echo meter collar size separator in the well. And, and notice the pump now is full liquid and the gas rate has increased to 161 MCF per day. And, and why, why could it do that? Because now we're starting to draw the well down and get flow from the well and that means more gas flow, more liquid flow. Now, so this is this is what's going on. The pool board gas separator they had in the well was failing because the gas separator had a, had a capacity of 96 barrels a day and it was failing because the, the, the pump displacement was 141. It was exceeding the separator capacity at the six inches per second. This is a this is dewatering a gas well, so water and air or water and gas. But once they ran the collar size separator in the well, the collar size separator had a capacity of 242 barrels a day to separate gas from liquid, and the pump capacity was not more than the separator capacity, so the pump filled up and we started drawing the well down and producing gas. Now this is a well out in New Mexico in um, the Permian in New Mexico. And the operator said, this, this isn't working right. Here we've got a separate has sufficient capacity and we're producing some oil and some water and we're operating below the capacity of the separator. Well, it's got incomplete pump fillage. So at this, at 6.8 strokes a minute, to have gas interference, the gas bubble rise has to be slower than 4.6 inches per second. What does that mean? That means that when you have oil and water present in your liquid produced, that you tend to have a, a, a slower gas bubble rise because now you have a different density of fluid in this inside your separator. And you have to consider reducing the capacity of your separator either by increasing the capacity of your separator by either slowing this pumping speed down or making the cross-sectional area larger. Well, it's in the well already. We can't. We can't. We can't uh, make it bigger because it's already there. So what do we do? Well, we're going to slow it down. So if you look at this animation right here, it shows that the separator is going to fail because we're exceeding the separator capacity, and this liquid, this gas, is going to get pulled down in the dip tube. Well, I'm going to speed this up a little bit so we can get to the end here, and you can see now that the separator has failed because the after a few strokes we start to pull gas into the pump because the capacity of the separator doesn't exceed the pump displacement and we're pulling gas into the pump. So what do we do? Well we we slowed it down from 6.8 strokes a minute to 6.1 strokes a minute and now look all the strokes are full and there's an example of that in our example data that show that shows this. Uh, this is a, this is a well up in up in Alaska, and this field they used to produce uh, with 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 gas lift, and they decided to sell all the gas from the gas field to Anchorage to to heat the city, and so as they depleted the gas in this field, they had to put on uh, Botaflex pumping units, long stroke pumping units, and so the the engineer in the field knew that he was having gas, having gas interference problems and he designed a gas separator that had a 60 foot long dip tube. He had a 6 foot perforated sub here and a 6 foot perforated sub here. Some kind of latch assembly that sealed off the, 
the annular fill off the casing and, and created a uh, area where it forced the liquid to go through this perforated sub into the annulus up here and then back in this perforated sub between the, the dip tube inch and quarter dip tube and the idea of the two and seven inch tubing and then into the pump and he sent this to me and I said well you know this 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 cross-sectional area here means that you're you have a separation capacity of 147 barrels a day and I said your pump dis displacement is 324 barrels a day so you got gas in the pump because your pump displacement exceeds its, your separator capacity and so this is a picture of his pump pump car and the, this this well had really high pump pump, pump intake pressure, 2,000 pounds of pump intake pressure for the gas. So the gas is a high pressure, and so when you compress this gas from 2,000 to 3,000 pounds of discharge, discharge pressure is 3,000 pounds. Then this is how much gas is inside the pump, free gas inside the pump. So the pump is only this full of liquid, and this full of, this full of gas. A really interesting well, 80% full of gas. The pump card doesn't really show it, but it it shows it. If you look at the equivalent gas rate pump fillage line. And so this is a simulator that shows that, well, hold on, we have a limit in the software where we said you, you don't need a dip tube more than 240 inches. Uh, what's that? It's about 20 feet, no more than that. Well, he had one that was 60 foot long. It doesn't help. The longer, the longer it is, it doesn't matter. It just takes more time for the liquid, the gas to get pulled down into the pump. So, in fact, if you have a change of pressure of 40 PSI on uh, oil, then a barrel of liquid at the surface would, would, would evolve from the oil. So, if you, if, you drop, if you change the pressure from this point to that in a long dip tube, you're going to have gas break out inside your dip tube just because the pressure changed. And also, you can have friction. Friction drops are going to cause some pressure drop also. So, both of those are disadvantages. So here in this case, the, this is an animation showing that this gas separator uh, had 147 barrels a day capacity is being exceeded. And the, the engineer said, well, this can't, this, this separator has got to work because I spent $125,000 putting it in this well. And I said something like, well, I don't think it matters how much you spend. It matters about what the cross-sectional area is between the OD of the dip tube and the ID of the separator wall. And then he didn't talk to me anymore. So anyway, that's just... So here we're going to talk about a little bit about the idea of capacity. And we're going to talk about the fluid that goes up the tubing and the gas that goes up the casing. And we can determine the separator efficiency based using the TAM software. And so here is the surface dynamic card that we acquire with our dynamometer. Here's a pump card. And we calculate a fluid shot, there's 9.1 MCF of gas going up the casing. We calculate there's, there's 8.7 MCF of gas going up the tubing. That includes the gas in solution. And then the ratio of this efficiency is, is the how much of the total gas, which is 17.8 MCF per day, how much of that gas is going up the casing? Well, 9.1. 9.1 divided by 17.8 is 51% efficient. So that's not a very efficient separator. So this is an example of a well that has 100% oil, 100% oil production. It's 100%, it's 59 barrels of oil and no water. So again, if you run a gas separator in this well, you're going to have to reduce the capacity of the separator based on a reduced gas bubble rise. You know, gas bubble rise may be a third of what it would be in water. So it may be only two inches per second versus six inches per second. And I guess there's this reference. Uh, that's the free gas in the pump is a, is a well file. So gas separation capacity is impacted by the casing size. And so if you look at this table, you can see that here is two and three eighths inch separators for four and a half inch casing. And you have two and seven inch separators maximum size OD for five inch casing, and then you have you can have large separators inside a seven inch casing. So when you look at this table, you start to realize that when someone drills a well with a certain size casing, they're deciding when before they drill a well, 
what the maximum liquid production out of the well would be with a rod pump. So if I'm going to run a rod pump in a in a well that's been drilled with 400 inch casing and it's going to have gas production out of this well, I'm not going to expect to have more than 275 barrels a day because that's the biggest capacity gas separator in water and air I can run in this well with 2 and 3 inch tubing. If I run a have five five half inch casing, and I run a two and seven inch tubing in the well, then the maximum separation with water and air is 445 barrels a day. If I have seven inch casing, now think about this: if you're producing mostly oil and the gas bubble rise is only two inches per second, that means the capacity separator would be reduced by by one third. So if you have seven inch casing and you have oil being a lot of oil being produced then this separator for oil and gas may only be 200 and barely 210 barrels a day. It's not very much. So when you start to get into oil and water, the gas bubble rise is going to go down from 6 inches per second down as a gas, as the oil starts to affect the gas bubble rise. Here's some recommendations. Um, if you have a rat hole, Set your intake below the purse, but be, make sure it didn't have sediment. Clean it out. Um, if you run a gas separator, don't make the separator too big and reduce the area outside the separator to less than 20% because that will tend to force the gas velocity to a high rate and create a mist. Uh, your separator that you run in the well, the gas separator, should exceed the net pump capacity. That's, that's important or your separator fails. Uh, the separator software, you should use it um, to size your separator before you run the tubing in the well. Uh, you can use your dynamometer and your fluid level shot to see if your separator is effective. If you have a high gassy fluid level and your pump's not full, then probably your separator is failing. Um, you can use the TAM software to determine the, the, the efficiency of your separator based on the gas of the tubing and the gas up the casing. Uh, the dip tube length we didn't talk about. But let me go back and show you that real quick. If I go to a, a picture of the separator simulator, right here on the screen it says minimum effective dip tube length. And it's telling you the, the shortest length you can have for this condition in your well. So so that's that's a it, we calculate the dip tube length in the software. Now, I asked Jim one day, I said, well, I said, why would we anybody run a 27-inch long dip tube? And he said, well, we, we, they won't run one because they would think it would be too short. So, we, echo meters is about, about 5 foot long, a little bit more than 5 foot. And you can calculate the minimum length of, by using this rule of thumb equation, 200 divided by the strokes per minute. And that's about, and all it is is how far does the gas go into the separator uh, when the standing valve ball is on the seat. How far does it go down? If it goes past that distance, then it can't get, get back out um, if it's going 6 inches per second. Uh, long, long separators don't help. They don't tend to increase efficiency. They might just add a few more strokes. Uh, if you have a tubing anchor and restricts the gas flow, it can cause the pump to have gas interference. Uh, this is something that some, some people don't think about. You know, a gas separator has a maximum capacity and you don't want to exceed the capacity of your suck rod pump. The casing size when you drill the well restricts the case this gas separator size which restricts re restricts the amount of production you get out of your well with the suck rod pump. So you should design your separator for your well conditions and they should be high efficiency separators with a large area. Use a sit down separator simulator to uh, size your separator based on your displacement, uh, your strokes per minute, and an estimated gas bubble rise. Now, the gas bubble rise, no one knows what it is in your field, so you might have to do some testing in your liquid to get a better estimate. Most gas separators are sized based on six inches per second air bubble in water rise. Uh, the simulator animates and shows you how it works, which is kind of nice. Um, and being able to see that 
kind of helps you understand gas separation better. So I like the simulator a lot. Um, but to be if, to effectively produce your suck rod lifter wells and you produce gas, then you need to operate your gas separator within its operational limits. Says, uh, Fernando says several vendors began offering separators with intake or slots located on the top face of the separator instead of slots on the side that are in the small annulus between separator OD and the casing ice. Do you have any thoughts on whether this might prevent from gas entering separator? I think if you have an oversized separator, is it, there, it might help because you have the larger area above the top of the separator. So if you if you have an oversized separator, let's say your tubing is two and three eighths, and your casing is seven, then if you have your intake above the above the side of the separator, it might help a little bit because that might use a larger area. But I haven't done any work on that, so I don't really know. But um, that's a good point. That's a good question. I just I don't know. We haven't studied. I don't think we've ever studied that. I don't, I don't know. We've you know we we looked at putting some holes in the separator in Dr. Podio's test, but I don't think that improved the performance. So we did put some holes in the laboratory, and we didn't see any improvement as far as I recall. So I, didn't, okay. I don't I don't answer that question very well, but you know I don't have any experience on it. And the testing that we did, and we drilled holes in the top of the separator. I don't think we saw any improvement in the separator performance. Okay. Well, we have one more question from Riley. He say, is there a minimum diameter of the deep tube that pressure drops starts to increase free gas? Well, that's why you want it short, because you make it smaller, that you will increase the pressure drops through it. So if you make a long, a long skinny dip tube that has a small area, you're gonna have more pressure drop, more gas breakout. So um, that's another reason to make it short. So, so I, I, that's what I'd say. I, I, I don't think it. I don't think the the small diameter is that significant unless you do a pressure drop calculation on it, and you and you have too much pressure drop. Okay, I'd say 40 or 50 psi pressure drop would be probably too much. I wouldn't want that much. That's all we have so far. Thank you, Lynn. All right, now the the concept of horizontal gas separation started to come up, come into being because we weren't drilling any more vertical wells. And so we are, we're drilling a few vertical wells, but most of the wells that we drill now were horizontal. And so about 2013, we started, we started talking about um, separators for horizontal wells. And the first idea that we had was to come up with a, come up with a, um, we call it a diverter gas separator, and we built a we built a little a model out in the in our office, and we did some testing on it. And Jim and I were out there looking at the separator, and he asked me how much pressure drop is across the seal at the bottom of the diverter separator. How much pressure drop is required? And I said, well, about this much, and I said, oh, maybe maybe five psi. And he said, well, you don't need a packer. So why are you running a packer with a diverter separator when you only have to have 5 psi of differential pressure? And so that, that, was, a, that was a step where we started realizing that we, would, we could improve the performance of the, of this, of the gas separator, the, the, the packer-style separator, the diverter-style separator. And so the idea is, is that if you want to run a suck rod pump in a well, you can have less failures in the well if you have the separator, the, the intake of the suck rod pump, uh, above the kickoff point, but have the have the fluid entry into the system down somewhere in the horizontal section of the well bore, or right down below the kickoff point. And by doing that, you uh, put the suck rod pump in the preferred position to operate for long life. And you have less failures, which is this is what this is kind of saying right here. And the position where you want the intake is somewhere between you know 60 to 70 degrees of, of, of wellboard inclination from the vertical, so that uh, you're not carrying sand into the separator; you're just carrying uh, liquid with gas. 
So doing this, we call a diverter gas separator, and we we say it's really the ultimate 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 production system for suck rod lifted wells and horizontal wells. So that's where UPS came from. And why we call it ultimate because when you set your pump in the vertical section and you draw the fluid level down to the to the kickoff point and you don't want to sit, put your pump into the into the curve to cause higher failure rates, then what are you going to do? Well, you're going to you're going to try to run some tailpipe below your suck rod pump. Well, if you run tailpipe below your suck rod pump and the tailpipe discharges into the pump, then any gas that goes in the tailpipe is going to be trapped, and it's going to fill your pump up with gas. So this is our this is our first this is our first uh, experiment, I guess. Uh, this is in 2006 and before that, um, we ran um, cups, not pack not packers, but cups, inverted to to stop the gas with the casing. We ran a, a small diameter tailpipe and a, a tubing anchor which centered the separator and then some disc here that would prevent any solids that came out of this uh, diverter separator from falling back on the tubing anchor and sticking the tubing anchor so these little rubber discs kept the solids from falling down and sticking the, sticking the anchor so the, so the gas and liquid would flow at a high rate to the tailpipe in this assembly and then go up to up this tube, out these ports, fall back down these, and this would feed it back into the center dip tube, into the pump. And so, this is this is we call this a diverter gas separator, and it, and it worked sometimes really well, and sometimes not so hot. One of the wells that Ken and I went to that didn't work so hot, is there was a centralizer here that that was used to keep the tubing anchor and the cup centered, and the operator said. Well, I didn't want like the way that centralizer looked, so I didn't run it. And so what they did is when they ran their, their cups into the well, they just rubbed the cups on the side of the tubing down 8,000 foot, and they, they rubbed the cups off. And so that, that didn't work so hot. And so in 2017, we started using a low-profile packer that is uh, short, and, and, and that provided a, a, better, a better seal. And we started to get a little bit better and learned a little bit more. And then in 2018, we found that the gas that was, what do I mean? Let's talk about this first for a second, the gas. So here's the liquid and gas flowing up, flowing up the well bore. And this is sealed off right here. And so this space between the cups and the tailpipe get filled with gas. And so there's a liquid level in the annulus right about there. And there's a gas cap from here to here, and, is, and there's low pressure here, low, low gas pressure. And the gas tends to flow around and help lift the liquid and gas up through this assembly and discharge into the annulus. And then the gas goes up and the liquid falls down. Now, that was a great idea. Except when they instrumented this in a well in West Texas, they found that there's little bitty, little bitty discharges of gas causing a little bit of slugs of liquid up, up the tailpipe. And so we decided to put some cups here to, to hold this gas in place so it wouldn't release into the tubing and cause slugging flow. And so that, that improved it, significantly improved um, the performance. Um, we used a better critical rate design for the size of the tubes. We, we, we did some other things to make this work better. So that, that really improved the operation and increased the performance. And lately, we've gone to using it with ESPs and plunger lifts. So this is slimline ESPs and regular size ESPs and large size casing, where you have a 7-inch casing here at top and then a liner below. And this is uh, the entire horizontal well is the same side of the pipe. So we're going to run a slim, slim line ESP. So these these changes um, helped by um, sustaining critical rate th through the curve. Now, let me talk about that just a little bit. So if you don't size this pipe correctly right here, and you start to get flow below critical rate, then your liquid is going to start to run back out of the tube. 
So it's important to make this tubing size the right size, or you won't lift the liquid. Okay, And by doing that, um, you're able to draw the well down to much lower pressure and deliquify the well. And you have to size this pipe for low rates, low rates at the end of life when your bottom pressures are low. And then you have to also size it, size it to work when the rates are a little bit higher. So, so this, this is a tricky, tricky part of sizing that pipe to be the right size. And so when it's done properly, then the results are exceptional. And this is an example here where before this, the UPS was running the well, um, we had 125 mcf of gas and three barrels of oil. Then after, we have 16 barrels of oil. And notice it, it continues to increase in production rate. Why, why for a horizontal well, it should be on a decline. Why does the rate go up? Because we're dewatering and continue to draw the well down and increase flow out into the horizontal pipe. So we're getting more production and we see this incline in gas rate. And that's another function. A lot of the horizontal wells and the, and the, and the shale wells uh, tend to have a higher and higher gas rate over time. So this is an increasing gas rate over time. Now this is in, in, in Colorado. It's called the Nairobi field, Nairobi field. And before 50, uh, barrels per day and 45 mcf of gas after 140 mcf of that gas and uh, 75 barrels of oil a day so that's that's a 25 barrel a day oil increase and you can you know see it's significant when when you when you change it's a pretty significant increase right here where we installed the, the up system in the well now this is a Bakken and if you look you can see again the the look there's a the oil was on a decline and here we installed the, the ups, and actually the the decline rate became an increase. And you changed the, the well from being a decrease to an increase, which is which is unusual. And the gas is going up over time also. And that this well is, uh, over this time period, seven months, is three hundred fifty thousand dollars of increased revenue just due to the due to the ups being installed in this well. Uh, this is another well. I think it's a Balkan well. Went for only from three to six barrels of oil, but almost tripled the gas flow rate. So it's pretty successful. It's pretty successful once we've figured, went through all the process of figuring out what we need to do to make it work, work the best. So if you have questions about the up system, uh, Brian Ellithorpe takes care of that. There's his email and his phone number if you'd like to call him for additional questions. I can probably answer some of the questions, but Brian can answer any of the questions. So that's that. Now, do we have any more questions, Gustavo? Do we want to go on to the workbook? We have uh, one more question from Trent. He's asking, have you ever played with deep tube metallurgy in order to reduce the drop so you can minimize the deep tube farther? So using titanium dip tubes. Is that what the question is to use yeah, it? If we have played with the metallurgy, we have tried right, right, different right. types of. You know, we haven't. We haven't. First of all, uh, we haven't tried titanium because that would make us a really tiny, a small dip tube. Um, Pioneer did a lot of work with using a fiberglass, fiberglass uh, outer barrels, and they were successful. They would run large OD, oversized gas separators in the. Sprayberry near Midland, and that was that was successful. So they use fiberglass. It's uh, non-corrosive. It uh, they, their 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 wells weren't too hot, and so they were successful by using uh, fiberglass instead of instead of um, metal. And but they had seven-inch casing, so they could run they could they could run large, oversized gas separators that had high capacity. So we haven't. Um, you can. Um, request that the separators be made out of stainless steel, and there's an extra cost for that. So if you if you want um, corrosion resistant separators, we can we can build one out of stainless steel, but we haven't done any metallurgy uh, research on making the dip tube out of titanium, so it'd be a small diameter tube, um, and give you more area on the outside. We just haven't we haven't done that. So that was the only question, Gustavo. Yes, that was the only question so far. Uh, all right, all right. 
So this, so this next section that's coming up here is on the simulator. And there's a technical paper that we wrote on that back in 2014. And um, Carrie Ann, when she set this web page up on Ask Echometer, she also linked to a, a, a video that we recorded with Jim McCoy. He, he did a presentation on gas separators. And he also did a presentation on the uh, gas sep separator simulator. So not only can you listen to me talk about it, there's also a link to listen to Jim talk about the, the, the simulator software. So that's available. Um, and and this, this workbook I'm going to talk about is, has a brief description of the simulator program. And then it has a couple examples, and we'll go through those examples. Um, so we've already kind of seen some, some um, animations where we've uh, screen captured uh, the, the gas separator simulator software. And just by seeing how the gas and liquid separate, I think that increases your understanding of how gas separation occurs in the well. Um, I think that there's um, it enhances ideas and helps you think about different things, like the questions we had today. Even were good good questions. The one about using a a, 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 a lighter metallurgy like titanium that might uh, make the dip tube OD smaller. That that was a good idea. I don't know about the similar metals. And then the other idea about opening the ports on the top. If you could take advantage of the oversized separator, the smaller area. Uh, between the casing wall and the oversized separator is going to increase the gas flow, but if you go above the separator and take out make an in, intake ports there, that might improve the separator performance. But I don't I don't recall the studies from Dr. Podio, so that's a question we'll need to answer after this is over, I think. Now, inside of the TAM software, we animate the pump chamber, and so this is a this is a uh, a pump chamber, chamber animation plot, and it's showing the pressure inside the pump chamber and shows how the, the gas and liquid and oil, the gas is in white, the oil is in green, and the blue is the water, uh, how they behave inside the pump. Now, the, the gas separator simulation software is outside the pump at the intake, and so this is, this is inside the pump, here, inside the pump, but we're going to look at the outside of the pump on the inside the separator on this, on this next section. And so this is this is the separator simulator software, and it's on the web page. And Carrie Ann put a link to it. You can download it, install it on your computer. Uh, there's no additional charge for using this download this software. There's it's free. Um, there's a little a little um, release you have to check before you use the program. It has. Um, you click this button and it runs it for the what you select on the left hand side. This is the separator sizing. If you um, decide to put your own separator dimensions in here, you can save it and give it a name by clicking the save button. And so it's not just echometer separators that you have on your on your computer. You could have your own separators uh, sized on your computer and animate them if you want. Uh, the echometers are defaulted. You get to drop down and pick echometers, or the poor boy gas separators are defaulted. Um, here's the dip tube length based on uh, gas bubble rise and the production rate in the well. I spoke for a minute. Uh, the slower you pump, the longer the dip tube should get. Um, what else? Gas bubble rise, 6 inches per second, is for what? For water and air. And you might want to derate this if you have oil production in your well. You might want to study it. Even even tonight, you can study it. You can go to the you can go to the, the bar and buy a bottle of beer and take a sip, and then time that gas bubble rise in the in the in the beer, and see how fast the gas bubble rise comes up. And then you can cut you can charge that beer as a as a business expense. Yeah, that'll work. Here's your strokes per minute, and the software is assuming that at this strokes per minute, this is your pump displacement. So these are these are together. If you change this SPM, you're going to need to change your, your pump displacement. If you don't change the pump displacement, but you change the strokes per minute, we're assuming that you make a bigger diameter pump. Okay, the diameter the diameter of the pump's not shown here. So notice that these two are kind of together. 
you change one, you got to change the other. Because if you just change the stroke per minute and don't change the pump displacement, to maintain the pump displacement, you have to have a bigger diameter pump. This is the maximum separator capacity based on all this information that you've that you've input. Um, there's a document. If you click help, the document come pops up, and you can see that. And then I think Ken Skinner's name. Let me just let me put this over and just see if that's not correct. Here's the simulator software on my on my desktop. If I click help, yeah, call, call Ken. There's Ken's direct phone number right there. Um, info. There's a technical paper that pops up. So that's the paper that's on the memory stick, and that's that's available when you click help. All right, so that's a separator, and you can download from a web page. Uh, this this just lists um, these are six papers. And I think these are the short course SPE master's thesis, master's thesis, um, Canadian paper. All these papers here were were were, as in my understanding, is is that Echometer help fund this research along with Chevron and Conoco and Phillips and Artesia uh, Yates Petroleum so this has been an ongoing project since 1995 and just recently Echometer uh, Jim McCoy has funded um, a gas separator test facility at the University Oklahoma State Oklahoma University OU in uh, Norman so we still are interested in gas separation so there's a lot of a lot of information there's some videos that that Dr. Podia recorded on uh, downhill gas separator uh, performance uh, on the University of Texas education webpage that's available so here's a a gas separator and we've got the separator has been selected. It's a poor boy gas separator, a certain diameter, so it's two and seven eighths diameter here. That's the OD. It's got an ID of 2.5 inches right here inside, two and a half inches. The dip tube OD is 1.66, so that's this dimension right here. Um, ID is one three eighths, and so it's it's the scale horizontally based on the OD of the separator. And the dip tube length here would be 72 inches, and the, and the flow rate and the velocities here in the, in, inside this animation are scaled to the length of the dip tube. So that's that's the scaling that we have on here. And the net pump capacity is less than the separator capacity. So at six inches per second, we're showing all the bubbles get out of the separator, gas bubbles get out of the separator on the downstroke. So here's our upstroke, and we pull the gas bubbles into the separator. And here we start the downstroke, and the gas bubbles rise inside the separator. And as long as they all get out on the downstroke, then the separation efficiency is 100%. Now, if I take this little slider here and slide it to the right, all right. Let me pull the separator simulator software back on top of this. This may be confusing, but let me kind of get it offset. One of the things that we talked about is there's a there's a high dimensions and show the dimensions, and so so that's also available. And that that didn't actually show this here. All right, let's go to the next slide. When we look at this animation here, let me, let me talk about it just for a second. You know, the, the plunger starts out at zero velocity and it quickly speeds up. And then it reaches, reaches a, a kind of a maximum speed and then it stops at the top and goes back down. And so we, we're trying to simulate that velocity inside the pump with this graph right here. So we assume that the first 5% of the upstroke, there's no velocity. And then we assume the last 2% of the, of the upstroke, there's no velocity. And then we assume that the plunger velocity over most of the stroke is 3.77 times the average average flow rate of the well. So that's that's our velocity profile inside the separator. 
And we've talked about, well, we haven't done this, we've talked about using the export the TAM plunder velocity out of the software in TAM and read this. Maybe sometime in the future we'll, we'll provide the actual plunder velocity from TAM as an input to the separator simulator software, but we haven't, we haven't done that yet. But anyway, this is, this is the velocity profile of the pump. Of the pump. Now the dip tube, the length below the dip tube port, so this distance right here below the bottom of the ports is the length of the dip tube. And this says a thousand, well you can't, you shouldn't run one more than 20 foot long, that's what this is saying. Uh, if it does, it gives you an error. Um, there's no way if the, the gas bill was down here uh, 480 inches into the separator that that gas bubble could ever get out. If the gas bubble is down 480 inches, 20 foot down, it's going to go into the dip tube and go into the pump. So so you don't need a 20 foot long dip tube. It's, it's just, um, I don't know, longer is not better. And I think longer just means you can charge more for it. It doesn't really help. The only thing the longer dip tube does is it takes more strokes to pump it off to pull that gas interface down to the in intake of the dip tube. And that's all it does. Now we've, already, we've already said this several times. If, it doesn't, if the gas doesn't get out at the end of the downstroke, then it's going to get pulled in the pump. So it, it, all the gas must exit on the downstroke. Now this, I said this, that the separator capacity should, see, should exceed the net pump capacity. Now, where does the net pump capacity come from? Well, you can run, run Q-Rod and put in your pump information for your pump clearances, your plunger length, viscosity, and it'll calculate the slippage. And then the pump displacement minus the slippage is your net pump capacity. And that's what you should use in, in, to ensure that your separator this capacity exceeds that net pump capacity. Um, this is just arguing about the long dip tube. You shouldn't. You shouldn't have long dip tubes. It actually hurts because there's more pressure drop, and gas will come out of solution as it moves up the dip tube, and friction will increase the pressure drop. That's two different things. But they're it's, we're we're opposed to long separators. Echometer is. If you exceed the separator capacity with your pump, you're going to pull gas into the pump and have gas interference. You should. We're going to run the separator and talk about some examples here in just a minute. Um, this is a good this is a good point here. You know, when, when you start to have gas interference, you usually just don't have a little bit of gas. You have a lot of gas because what happens is is that inside when when you're exceeding this, this when we start to exceed the capacity of the separator, okay, then Whatever's out here on the annulus starts to be inside the dip inside this space, and it's inside your pump. And so usually what echometer sees when you shoot a fluid level is we usually see in a gassy well, you know, 20% liquid on the outside. So it's it's very common if you have a, a gas separator failure because your capacity of your pump exceeds the capacity of the separator to have only 20% of the liquid in, in your pump. And the rest of your pump strokes being lost to gas, and that's that's a normal normal behavior of a, of a failed gas separator. And so that's what this is saying right here. It's just saying that you know once you fill it, you you really fill it. Just don't fill it a little bit. It, it it fills up with gas, and you have very poor liquid production. Just like that Frank's well showed that you know almost no production because the pump is full of gas and it's just not pumping any liquid. All right, now this is, we've already kind of shown this before, but, but I'll talk about it again. Notice here on the downstroke, the gas bubbles get out on the downstroke, and here we have 80 uh, barrels a day pump displacement and 96 barrels per day capacity of the separator. And we're pumping at six strokes per minute with, with a, a six inch per second gas bubble rise. And then we're going to turn that up to 96, and when you see 96, it's going to show that, again, all the gas gets out on the downstroke, and so the separator still performs if you're right there at your separation capacity. And then once if you, let me go over here, exceed the separator capacity, 120 versus 96, then now we see that on the downstroke, these gas bubbles don't leave 
the separator and they get pulled into the pump on the stroke, that stroke or the next stroke. And so um, now you can see the gas interfering with liquid filling the pump. So the simulator is, is uh, you know, it got little black spots is, is the solids, a little gas, high, high gas velocity on the outside. And then when, the, when you go into inside the separator, the gas bubble now is based on the, the gas bubble rise and the and the velocity of the fluid. The little, the little triangle is, show, is supposed to show you the, 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 the velocity of the liquid inside the dip tube. Uh, it's different than the velocity of, of the liquid on the outside because there's a, a, a smaller area. This this middle sentence is I've, I've I've implied this, but you know it's probably not a bad idea to take some of your fluid in your in your reservoir uh, that you're producing and try to determine a reasonable gas bubble rise. I worked with a, a technician from far west Texas, and uh, we we picked the separator based on six inches per second and. He was all excited about getting, you know, 250 barrels or 300 barrels of liquid out of the well, and he produced about half oil and half water. And uh, when we turned it on, it was had a lot of gas interference, and he had to slow the well down to about the pumping speed because we ran in the well. We couldn't increase the size of the separator, so we slowed it down, and the pump filled up. So he said, "Geez, I'm I've I've lost about half of my my pump displacement due to you making me slow it down." I said, "Well." we should have considered that there's oil being produced in this well and the gas bubble rise of six inches per second was 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 probably over over uh, exceeded the actual gas bubble rise in your in your field and maybe we should have done some testing on that before and so this is it correct what 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 you know if you look at water and air or beer and air it's going to be six inches per second but once you start to have a, a lighter viscous oil it's going to be it's going to be less than that <coughs> all right any more questions, Gustavo? We have uh, one more question. Um, that's uh, actually involving the brand name, but I will skip it. So uh, someone's asking, if we run a three inches in a seven inch casing, so a three inches separator in a seven inch casing, and they work well uh, out of the gate, and then often fall on their face a few months on the road. Right, right. So why was that happening? This is the, the back end at ten thousand feet. Right. So so there's two things that could be happening. One thing could be that the the, the pump intake pressure is going down, and the the gas velocity on the outside of the separator is either increasing, creating a more a more mixed mixed fluid. Um, that would be one thing. Um, I don't. I think that's probably the primary thing. I think that's probably the the higher high, higher gas velocity on the outside is the only that's act, only thing that's actually changed. So what they should do, what they might want to do is try try slow the the pumping speed down, and see if that fills the fills their pump back up, because they have control over their pumping speed. So maybe if they slow it down just a little bit, they'll they'll get their performance of the separator back, uh, because they lowered the the velocity inside the pump chamber and inside the separator chamber and give time for the gas to get out. So so there was a, a technician in Oklahoma that would call me and say, hey, I've got this figured out. He said, we run these new pumps and I've got a variable speed drive here and when I start seeing gas interference, I just slow it down a little bit and it fills back up. And I said, that's great. Send me some data and I'll put it in a paper and we can talk about it and, and, and put a paper. And he said, oh, I can't send you any data because it's top secret. So, so <laughs> I guess my point, my point here, here is that once you've got the separator in the well, you can't do much about the separator in the well. The only thing you can do is about the ex external parameters, and the only external parameter that you have control over, pretty much, is the pumping speed. So I would recommend that you reduce the speed and think about the gas bubble velocity inside your separator. Go ahead and calculate or use this, the simulator to come up with the gas bubble rise. And see what the gas bubble rise likely is, and try to slow your SPM down to get the gas bubble rise to not be excessive inside your separator, and your pump will fill up. That's what that one example showed. That one example that showed that showed from uh, New Mexico showed that at 6.8 strokes per minute, 
the separator was failing and then at 6.1 strokes per minute the separator filled up and so I mean that's not much change and if, if you're going at 8 strokes a minute with a 3 inch separator and it was working before and now 8, sec eight strokes a minute it's, it's half full well what if you slowed it down to 5 strokes a minute and it filled up you still have this we'd still make more more production if you did that and it's probably the gas bubble rise so that's a long answer but I'd, I'd play around with the pumping speed yeah we have an extra input for that same topic from Riley and say some scale build up on the ID and the separator and the OD at the deep tube and that's a common issue they have noticed okay well that's going to change the area. area yeah yeah so that's area. that'll make the velocity go up and that'll make the capacity go down so if scale is a problem that's for sure could cause that is that the only question we have a long question from Trent do you know of any reputable published the studies which have been done with two-phase oil and water emulsions in which either the viscosity and the phase of water cost has been adjusted <coughs> to study the effect of those variables on bubble rise velocity. I know there are charts out there which show how the bubble rise velocity mm -hmm. for a bubble with a given OD changes with viscosity and in water polymer only solution. However, as you just implied, the presence of two liquid phases with different properties may hamper yeah. bubble rise significantly. Uh, a long time ago, probably about 15 years ago, I sat through a presentation and a, a professor from LSU did a presentation on gas bubble rise and had probably 10 different viscous fluids. And he had a, a family of curves, but I've never been able to find that. I've never found that presentation, so I don't know if it was just a a presentation with no written paper, but yeah, I've, I have seen that. There's either a master's thesis or a PhD thesis uh, from from uh, LSU, and there's probably some available from University of Tulsa, from the Tulsa University Artificial Project. So I would I would expect that there's been some research done. I don't know if Dr. Podio's done anything on uh, viscous fluids. You might ask, ask him if he has a, a has a comment. But um, I've, I've seen a couple presentations on it, but we haven't done anything. You know, we've talked about doing that. We've, 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 we've gone out and uh, sampled fluids and looked at oil, but we haven't done it any, any kind of detail. We just haven't done it. Okay. Well, we have one more question from Matt, and he's asking, how does separator inclination affect the simulated results? That's a good. That's a good question. Uh, this this graph right here. Okay, so if, so if you look, this is inclined. Doesn't say what angle. And so if you look at, and this is gas velocity on the outside. So if you have, if you're exceeding, if you're exceeding the critical rate, the separator is going to have poor results because you've got a mist. But if you have an inclined separator, then the liquid is going to run along the, the bottom side of the separator, even though and the gas is on the top, you're going to tend to have two-phase flow, gas on top and segregated flow, and the separator performance in, in, improves. So this, 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 this shows that to some degree, if the separator is inclined, I didn't say what, it doesn't say what incl inclination here, you might want to read this paper. But it says if you incline the separator, then the performance includes is improved because the fluids are segregated, and your critical flow rate is increased. Now, if you look at Turner critical velocity, the critical velocity you get about another 40% more gas required to go above critical rate. So you can have 40% more gas flow, and the performance of the gas separator still will be uh, liquid and gas. So the gas is on the top side of the, of the horizontal of the inclined pipe and the liquid is on the bottom. And so this looks like it's about almost three times better performance of the of the liquid capacity. So this 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 graph and this paper is probably a great reference for your question. I'd recommend you read this paper and then um, email us or Dr. Podio Tony. His email is on the the first page of the presentation, you know, email email him or me or all of us a question, and we'd be glad to talk with you further about that. 
One yeah. more question, Lynn. Thank you for that. Is uh, Scott is asking, do you have any recommendation for sizing the separator if the dynamometer data is not really is not available? Yeah, um, that's that's really the workbook. And so when you're going to size a separator, um, you need to think about wells that are, that are going to have gas interference problems. And then you're going to look at, it's going to have a high gassy fluid level, and it's going to have uh, free gas to pump intake. Uh, you, you need to know your, your gas flow rate, and you can look at your percent fillage of your pump. And so these are some things that you see that you see about uh, identifying gas interference. You need to know what your expected pump just pumping speed is. Um, what's your, let's call it your maximum pump displacement minus slippage. That's your pump capacity, pump displacement, or pump capacity because you've reduced your capacity or pump displacement because the slippage fills up some of the pump displacement. And your sizes are your tubing and casing sizes. And the, you put this data into the simulator. So that's that simulator is, I've got it running in the background. So this data would be input here. Okay. And then you're going to evaluate different types of separators that will fit inside the casing. And we'll, we'll talk about that. And then you look at your strokes for a minute and um, make sure you adjust your pump displacement based on the stroke for a minute if you change stroke for a minute. And then run the si simulator and see if your gas gets in your pump. And so, you know, the gas will get in the pump. Let me just pull this back over. If, if this number here exceeds the separator capacity, then it's, the animation is going to show that no gas if the pump displacement exceeds, it's going to show gas getting pulled into the pump. If the pump displacement is less than the capacity, let's make this less. Okay. Then on the downstroke, the, the gas gets out of the separator on the downstroke. So it gets pulled in, and then, well, it, it, i got to st stop it and start it. Let's rerun it here. Stop and then start. And then see this gas is, is, getting, is escaping. So, so I guess my point, my, here's my point. When you ask that question, what we're saying is that you can use the simulator, the simulator software to size your gas separator, and then you can also, there's a, a wide variety of separators that you can, Clint Haskins, he had his own separator, so I, I named Clint Haskins 4.5 inch separator. So you can type your own in and save it inside, inside the software as, as save as a preset, you can evaluate the one that you might build on site versus one that you could purchase from Echometer or that you could manufacture from a, a, a perforated sub, a dip tube, and a, a joint of tubing. So the so the so this the simulator software program I'm sure getting ready to show really is the answer to your question, in my view. So this is example number one. It says it's four and a half inch casing, and the pump set about the pump is set above the purse. You have some gas, inner gas flow. Um, you have liquid gas at the pump intake, so you have incomplete pump fillage. The casing is small in diameter. You can't set the pump in the rat hole because it's a vertical well, but there's no, there's no space below the rat hole, or you got solid problems. And you've, you've got your pumping speed as slow as it will go. So you're, you're at the minimum pumping speed. Okay, and so this is your, this is your well. You've got four and a half inch casing. And it's got ten and a half pound casing with an ID around ID around four inches. Okay, so your ID of the casing is about four inches. And you've got two and three inches tubing, and this is this input screen on the TAM software. Here's a fillable shot, and it shows you got based on the pressure buildup, we got about 80, 78 uh, mcf of gas going up the casing annulus. The the percent liquid based on the equimeter S curve is twenty three point four five percent. The pump intake pressure is right here, 232, best of the fluidable shot. So there's our pump intake pressure. And this well is it's about 10% oil. And so there's not very much oil being produced. And so um, maybe the 6-inch gas bubble rise will work on this well. And so here is the strokes. And this, is, this well is an example. It says need... Uh, Enter gas interference need gas separator, and so there's there's several strokes right here that we see on the screen. 
And there's 33 strokes in total that we've overlaid. And in the TAM software, if we go to the TAM program and we're to overlay all the strokes, in the field view, we'd see a whole, whole bunch of strokes. But this hole has two problems. And so not only does it need a gas separator because of incomplete pump fillage, but the other problem is you see a lot of strokes with the, the, the trailing valve staying on seat for the whole stroke and then coming off seat because there's a little tag. And so this, this pump probably has uh, some solids problems too. And so we need to, we need to make sure that if we um, put the right size gas separator in there, that we clean out any solids that we have in the well. Because it's also tend to have the trailing valve occasionally not open, probably due to solids. And so we, we need to address both of those problems. And it's, it's showing here that the, the pump fillage is varying from completely no fillage to somewhere around 70%. And the average fillage here is, this is average, average is about 55%. That's what that says. So if you look right here, there's, there's the average pump fillage on this well. But it's including these four or five strokes that are, um, what? That our China valve is, is staying closed for the whole stroke, staying valve staying open. All right, so we picked we pick this stroke as representative. And the maximum plunder displacement is, is 35 barrels a day. And it's pumping speed. It's not pumping very fast. So there's probably quite a bit of slippage here. But they probably ran a 3,000 pump clearance. So there's not a lot of slippage because of the tight clearances in this well, probably. This is some older data, likely 3,000 clearance. All right, so three, 35 barrels per day is the net pump displacement. Okay. And so we need to find a separator that will fit inside 10 pound 4 inch casing. Um, it has to have a capacity greater than 35 barrels per day. It has to have a gas capacity of 75 MCF per day, which means we can't have a velocity outside the separator more than 10 feet per second. Uh, the solids production, solids doesn't appear to be a problem, except that some of these strokes, it may be a problem. We may need to wor worry about that. Okay, and then we don't want an expensive one. So it's a marginal well because it's only making, it's not making that much production. Only about three barrels a day. So it's, yeah, four barrels of oil production, so we need to be low cost. And, well, it's it's less than 50 barrels a day, so poor boy gas separator uh, would work as long as the six inches per second gas bulb rises okay. And so that's what this that's what this screen shows. So here we, we, we went into the simulator software, we put other conditions in, 35 barrels a day, six inch bubbles inch per second bubble rise, uh, two point seven strokes per minute. There's their separator capacity. And if we were to click on run, then it's going to show that it's going to be okay and all the gas gets out uh, on the downstroke. And so this would work as long as the uh, as the uh, uh, six inches per second gas bulb rise works and probably okay since there's only 10% oil and 90% water. Um, now, it, it also notes here that what about the tubing anchor? Well, um, this well has a uh, tubing anchor and so possibly we may want to consider uh, a heavyweight uh, separator above the tubing anchor. So that would be an option that we may want to consider because there's no room, uh, there's no there's no um, no rat hole. Okay. Now this just shows us the 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 heavy the heavy walled tubing anchor, heavy walled gas separator, is set above the tubing anchor, and so it, you can pull attention to set your anchor. So that would be a consideration uh, where you'd want to set it above the purse. So that that may be that may be what we might want to consider also here. This just shows the separator capacity for heavy walled, and it's got plenty. So even if it's got a lower gas bubble rise, the heavy walled separator may be a good choice in this well because uh, you know we're using that six inches per second. That's going to uh, even if we derate it by a factor of three, it's still going to be um, you know plenty of room for three times more three times more flow. Now this is a, a gas separator in a large a large size cased hole. And the pump set in the per above the purse. It's uh, got a little bit of gas. Um, there's uh, liquid and gas at the pump. Uh, it's a large liner casing. There's no rat hole. It's running 12 hours a day. 
And uh, what else? Let's see. Uh, it's about 8,200 foot deep for the tubing. The pump's right down at 8,000 foot deep. 10 3 inch tubing. And this well, if you look right here, it makes 100% oil. And the percent liquid's like 41%. You got a 52 mcf per day gas rate. And so this one, you know, I might say, hey, we, we might want to think about um, using 2 inch per second as a, as a gas pulverize and derate the separator because this well makes all oil. And so that should be a consideration, not just the right here in this case, because we've seen that when you have high oil cuts, that the gas bubble rise tends to be less uh, than the six inches per second of water and air. And so here we lay over, overlay 10 strokes, and we see the average stroke is right about here. And the 214 barrels a day is a pump displacement that's adjusted. And um, there's the example, an example file, it's called WAG. Uh, not, it's not water alternating gas, but it's the name of the lease is WAG, is the name of the lease, that's why it's called WAG. Um, so it's got 24 pound casing, it's got 215 barrels a day pump displacement, it's got gas, gas production, solids don't appear to be a problem. Uh, let's try the 2 and 3 inch collar size separator. And sure enough, the 2 and 3 inch collar size separator is more capacity than the 215 barrels a day pump displacement. But, hold on, that's at 6 inches per second. So here we might want to consider 2 inches, change to 6 inches per second. Let me see if this is a video here. Is it a video? Yeah, it's a video. So here's the 6 inches per second, and um, we're going to change that. Let's run, run this up simulator. We're going to change that to 2 inches per second, and here... All the gas gets out on the downstroke if it's six inches per second gas bubble rise. But when we change the six to, there's two. Come on, change it. Then when we change the two, now the gas doesn't get out and the, and the, let's, minutes. Five minutes left. Did you say five or you say two, Gustavo? Five. Five. <laughs> We've got quite a few examples that I haven't covered, so I'm, I, I'm just getting through this last example. But the, what this is showing is that once we've changed it to two inches per second, notice that it's now 149, 149 barrels a day, and this separator that would work before won't will, will, you know, the pump displacement exceeds the separator capacity for a 2 and 7 8 collar size separator. So actually what has to happen here, if you have a, a 2 inch gas bubble rise, is you have to go to a much larger size separator. And so we'll, we're going to change that separator here to, let me see if I can get it over here. Change that separator to, to a 4 and a half inch separator. And now the separator capacity is equal to the, the pump displacement. So it's, it's a significant amount of capacity is lost when your gas bubble rise is not uh, six inches per second. And that was a that was a the point I wanted to make on this 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 slide here. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's tubing anchor is not a problem because it's large size casing. And so here's the emails that you if you want to contact us. Here's a link to Dr. Podio's work. Uh, that you can download from University of Texas webpage. And uh, that is the end of the presentation. And let me pop up TAM just for a minute and just talk about that real quick. So, if I, so, so this is, so when we go to look at the online examples, um, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven examples. And each of these examples here, go along with uh, some discussion during the presentation. This first one is one that Ken collected on a well uh, from, from in, the, in the Wolfberry. And if you look at this data, there's, there's 228 strokes here. And if I look at the, at, the event, at, at the event viewer here on the screen, what you'll see is that, gee whiz, all of these, all these strokes right here 
our incomplete pump fillage. And if you go to the very beginning though, and look at stroke number one, stroke number one is full, stroke number two is full, three is full, and where do we get this? Ten, Ken turned the well off for 10 minutes. Just let it sit there. And then you turn it back on, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight strokes are full, and then bam, after that, all the strokes are, are completely pumped off because, because in this well, this tubing anchor was was blocking the gas flow. And not completely blocking it, but allowed some gas flow to flow to the surface. And um, the very last shot he took on the well, the fluid level is down at the pump. But if we go look at the at these shots, there's a lot of fluid level shots here. And and you can see the perforation up kicks on all these. There's lots of there's lots of zones of perfs here that we see. There's this is probably the spray berry, and then this is another another formation, another formation, and then another formation. But if we look at all the shots here, let me let me look show these shots. I guess there's uh, let me see if this is it. No, this is still this this is yeah. Here's the here is the uh, fluid level at the tubing anchor, and in fact it's above. So th th that's what we see here. And they scale it down. Yeah. So when we before we before we push the fluid level down, we had this high gassy fluid level. But this this is we've already pushed it down to the pump. So I, I should have, I didn't get the fluid level shots I thought I got in here. I I uh, it's it's already been depressed and the and the pressure is 318 psi. So we've already pushed the fluid level below the tubing anchor on these shots. Let me see if there's time for just one more comment here. Uh, the Frank's well is a is a great example of before and after. The before there's two 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 tests here, and um, when you look at these two two examples here, um, the one is a poor boy gas separator here, and then the performance is terrible. And if you go look at the very first stroke, let's look at the first stroke on this well. The first stroke shows shows uh, you know. Normally, when you shut the well down, hook your equipment up, the first stroke is going to be okay, the second stroke is okay, and then bam, third stroke, you already have gas interference, and then from then on, it's just pumping gas up the tubing, and not very much, because all the stroke is being lost to gas interference, and all from then from then on, that's all we see is gas interference strokes, and that's what that's what the poor boy gas separator, with the perforated sub, jointed tubing, and the dip tube, and a bull plug on the bottom. So this is a this is a good comparison between. Um, undersized gas separation, and then a gas separator. And this is water and air. This is a this is a a, a well that's it doesn't show. It should just show 100% water, but it's only producing water and gas. And then on this one, all the strokes, all all 90 strokes, are all full because pretty much all full. I mean, there's a little bit of gas right there, but most of them are pretty full um, because of because of the um, why? Because the separator is not over its capacity. So, Kerry, I think I probably ought to quit. I've probably gone more than two hours, and then. Uh, well, maybe you could do because you have such great examples that you have ready. Maybe we could do like a separate, just sort of a supplemental recording to go along with this, because well, I think the examples would be really good for everyone to see. So we we can do that. Um, well, I can keep on talking until I go through all the examples if you want, and then everybody that wants to quit can quit. You can. You, That's fine if you want you, to do that. If you'd like to stay and listen to Lynn go through the examples here, those will be some really great examples, and it'll be good to hear the the stories and details behind them all. So, go go ahead, Lynn. Okay. Well, uh, thank you all for attending, and I'll keep on talking. Now, the other thing about this well is that there's there's two dynamic cards, and you can see that they're. They're about six months apart. This one is back in uh, May, and this one is the following year in February. So there was quite a bit of time between what's wrong with my well, and he had to convince the op he had he had to convince the company to pull the well, which cost money, and then run the gas separator in the well. And so it, <laughs> this I'm glad it was water and air. It worked really well. If you look at the shots, though, the shots are really interesting because the, 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 the unusual thing about this, if you look at the two shots, 
This flu level shot has a flu level down about 5,400 feet, and this one has a flu level at the same, almost the same depth. Now, what's going on here? Well, this is the weird part. If you look at this well with the flu level at at uh, the first one, when it's really really a lot of gas interference, the pressure buildup is only 0.25 psi per minute, and that means that if you go to the report and look at the report. There's almost no gas production. If we look down here at the gas, the gas rate, it's only 18 MCF of gas. And so even though that the pump is full of gas, and it's just pumping gas up the tubing, there's not enough free gas at all, even to really line up the line up the casing annulus fluid. But if you go look at this at the second shot, look, the, the, the pressure buildup is now 1.8 psi per minute. And all that has happened is the pump is pumping liquid now, and the gas is flowing to casing. And it's a significant change in the well, even though the fluid level stays exactly, almost exactly the same. And they were able to draw the well down and produce a well, and, and it was very effective. So this, this to me is a, a, a great example of how, how a, a, a poor, poor performing pump really not only reduces your liquid rate, but it, it produces a drawdown, so you, you have almost no gas flow either. And once you get the pump to pump by separating the gas, you get your, get, get, you get your gas flow up the casing, which is exactly what you wanted in this, in this case. Now, if we go to this next well, and this is free gas in the pump. This is the example number one that we looked at that had four and a half inch casing. And uh, there's, there's a couple of uh, data sets here. No, this is a different one. This is the one that's 100% oil. I'm sorry. This is this is a well that's 59 barrels of oil, and the reason why we picked this example is there's a couple of things that you see on this dynamic card. This is acquired with the horseshoe load cell, so these are measured loads, and uh, the fluid level is down close to the pump, and you can see that there's a little mechanical friction here between the between the what the load on the upstroke and the compression load on the downstroke. And um, you see that same distance here, the mechanical friction. So this is this this is a, a well that uh, Russell Brown with Wells Whispers collected and did a test on this well. And it, we were studying um, the gas separation calculations in TAM software. So this was this data here is collected for this button right here, pump card analysis. So when we click, click on the pump card analysis button, the reason why this, this data is somewhat important is because we want to understand how much gas is going up the casing and how much gas is going up the pump. Well, if you look at a pump card and you see from here to here is where what? The compression is occurring. Let me let me close that off just for a second. And we look at the field view. It says the pump displacement here is 73 barrels a day. And that's what the TWM software would report. And so often we would get questions from people in the field that would say, how come my well is not making 73 barrels a day? And we would say, well, there's some free gas in the pump. And they'd say, well, how do we know that? And so the purpose of this button right there is to answer that question. So when you go to the details view, the detailed view shows the adjusted pump displacement. The little eye spot there lets you tell, see it without what the adjustments are made. Those adjustments are made, and this blue line represents the free gas in, that from that line to the total stroke is the gas that enters the pump during the upstroke. That's a, that's a gas at the intake pressure, and then this is the gas right here from that blue line to that line. That's the volume of gas from here to here at the discharge pressure. So we go from intake pressure here with this much gas. And what's the intake pressure? Well, the intake pressure right here, at, if we look at this point right there, if we go right there, intake, dang it, intake pressure, I'll, 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 I'll right click on it, lock it. The intake pressure is about 196 psi. So we go from 196 psi of gas, now I'm going to unlock it. Come on, hey, unlock it. Unlock. Okay, I unlocked it. 
Now I go from 196 psi to right here, and now the pressure inside the pump chamber goes to 25, 2,534 psi. And so this this process of the plunger moving down takes a big volume of gas and compresses it to a small volume. And so if you go to the pump card analysis and you go to the work through these tabs right here, we've talked about this in a previous presentation, but on this page right here we say, look, at the top of the upstroke, 80 barrels of gas has filled our pump and interfered with liquid filling the pump. So right off the bat, we've lost 80 barrels of liquid on that stroke of pump displacement. And then when we compress this gas down to this point here when the trailing valve opens, we now have four barrels of gas at 2500 psi that, that now it's just 2.1 so we went from 41 inches of lost displacement and we compressed it 39 inches and now there's two inches 2.1 inches of free gas in the pump and then we also on this slide we say how much slippage is there and so the slippage is calculated as 11, 11 barrels per day and so there's your adjusted pump displacement now how much gas goes up the tubing? Well, it tells us that this much gas up the tubing and this much gas up the casing, and there's about 16 or 17 mc of gas uh, calculated, and that compares fairly well to 22 mc measured. And you can look at the ratio of this gas up the tubing compared to the total gas, and the separator is about 57% efficient. So this shows the gas separator efficiency based on the fluid level shot down the casing and the pump card and it's all calculated so that's that's showing you the gas separation efficiency and that's that's in the TAM software and that's something that we added I think in 1.4 or I think 1.4 all right so that was that that's that's this example so this is a good example that shows the gas separation efficiency now the next well is Needs a gas separator, and this is a is, this is a, in the workbook. And so there's about 33 strokes here, and this is a CBE test. If we go to the dynamic card, and we look at the dot, there's a, a valve test, and let's go look at the data here, the dynamic, the pump cards. And if we look at the events at the top, and we go through and look at these cards, we see that stroke one is full, stroke two is same valve stuck open. And stroke 14, same valve stuck open. And stroke 10, same valve stuck open. And which other one? And so, so there's some kind of problem in the well that's that's not completely related to gas interference. And so, usually when you see strokes like this, one of the reasons could be either scaling or solids that's causing the stain valve to stick open. And so, if we go click on this, this is an example of a stain valve that's stuck open where they're tagging. To, to, to operate it, to, to, to knock it off the seat, and and probably it's got gas for sure. It's got gas interference problems. There's gas interference. So we go, if we go look at the the first stroke, and we go to the field view, which is this button right here, then we can we can select the first stroke, which is stroke number one, and we can go slide this over and hold down the shift key and click on stroke 33 and all the strokes are overlaying and now when I run my mouse along here you can see whichever stroke I'm on like right there I'm on that stroke 18 that stroke 17 you can see how the pump fill is just this is this is low pressure gas interference so these guys have the fluid level that's gone down fairly well they've got fluid above the pump but they need to install a gas separator to keep the gas from entering the pump and that would fix a lot of this problem and then they also need to address the solids. So if they, how do they address the solids with a gas separator? Well, they need to run a couple of joints of tubing below the bottom of the gas separator to hold the solids. So the solids will come in with the fluid, and the solids will drop past the end of the dip tube, and then they'll be, they'll be accumulated in the and the tubing below the end of the end of the gas separator with the bull plug on the bottom. So two to three joints of tubing they might need to run in this well, because this is an indication that we're probably producing some solids. Probably you don't know for you know we need to look at the well and find out if it's scale causing the same valve not to seat or is it solids probably so, solids because you know it seats 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 and then it it, it didn't right there so uh, but this is a, this is a good example of um, 
low pressure, pretty low pressure, you know, it's, it's um, 232 psi, it's gas interference, it's got a little bit of mechanical friction, this, this nose here. Um, this nose here could be because of restricted, restricted uh, flow through the standing valve. You know, the, the fluid level says that the, the, the pump car load should be going up to here, but if you have restricted flow through a standing valve, then the intake pressure would be zero, which would, which would be, if you look at this, the, the, the load line is above FO max, right, FO max. So that's saying the pump intake pressure, chamber pressure is zero. So if we go over and look at this slide right here, and we run our, run our mouse along here, it's saying that the chamber pressure is zero. That's what that shows right there. All of this, all of this stroke is, is zero. So during the upstroke, the chamber pressure is zero based on the pump card. Well, how can it be zero? Because on the outside, the, 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 the pressure is 232 psi. Well, either mechanical friction is causing that load to go above level max, or a restricted intake that has scale on the standing valve, which could be causing that card right there to be due to scale and solids. So there's this well needs more. This well, it would be nice to do some more research on this on this well, and try to understand why it's doing that, and that might that might fix another problem. It could be a, a standing valve that could have too small of flow area that's causing could be causing that problem and cause that that this this nose right here. Anyway, let's go on to the next one. The next one is the Phantom Well. And this is a well where we'd, they'd ran the separator in the well, and we've been looking for a well that had a um, variable speed drive on it. And this this well has has a variable speed drive on the well. And um, once we slowed it down to 6.14, then then the strokes were full. You know, you see the strokes are full. And if we go back to an earlier earlier set of data on this well, it's a pretty gassy well. It's got a lot of high, high gassy fluid level. We look for the the if we look at if we look at the um, previous strokes. Let's go back and find the dyne history. And we'll look for the pumping speed, which is like, we have strokes per minute here. Uh, I'll just go back early. I don't see the strokes per minute. Maybe we can maybe we can pick strokes per minute. No, I don't think strokes per minute is an option. So that would be nice to have, but it's not here. So we're going to go, they're just going to go back and look at an earlier one right here. And we're seeing the incomplete pump fillage. And here's, we got that, uh, look, the, look, at the, look at the tubing pressure. The tubing pressure on this well is 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 up between 500 and 600 psi pressure. This is a really gassy well. It's full of gas, pumping gas with the tubing, and if they don't maintain high back pressure on the tubing, it's gonna it's gonna flow off. So so this well had has all kinds of problems on it. And if we look at the vent viewer, we'll see lots of gas interference. Well, there's few, there's some strokes, but once they get past that point, they have lots lots of gas interference, and they're running high back pressure on the well. And they're pumping gas up the tubing, and and they have a gas separate in the well. And what they did was they slowed it, slowed the pumping speed down, and that that filled the pump up, which which is which which was not a, that big a compromise because all they did was they went from 6.8 strokes a minute down to 6.1, and if 6.8 strokes a minute is going to run about run about this or have less run time, then you're going to have a lower production rate even though you're pumping faster. All right, let's go to the next one. The next, the next one is the Slauson well, which Ken Ken collect, collected this up in North Dakota, and there's a paper we wrote on it, and it's been published in a, in a paper. And um, there's ten wells, and this is one of the wells, and this one had a, a color size gas separator in it. I think it's two and through two and seven eighths, and uh, all in fact all the strokes are full. And so this is a, and, and we had that, the plot shows that, uh, the fluid level shot shows on the outside, it's got a high gassy fluid level, but the 100% pump fillage, that's pretty effective gas separation. And so, um, well, 
this is making a lot of oil. So that, so what about that? What about that? Uh, what's the pump displacement? Pump displacement is around 400. So it, it's a, it's a it's a it's it's a good it's a good you know in this case probably six inches per second is working. All right, this is a Bakken well. Maybe the Bakken oil works different than the Permian oil. So the fluid level shot shows if you go to the high fluid level, if we scale it down, there's a pretty high fluid level. Go to the report, and the report shows 27% uh, 27 liquid through this, through this casing pressure buildup. So it's pretty gassy on the outside of the pump. And uh, all the gas is being separated at the pump intake, which is, which is remarkable. And then the very last well, the very last well is this uh, Wagner well. It's called WAG. And uh, that's, that's a, not a valve test. Even it looks like a valve test. And there's like 159 strokes here. And then there's 162 strokes here. And um, this, is, this well is one of the examples. But it's which strokes representative. And you know we talked about that in an earlier presentation. And on this well, if you go if you go look at the event viewer, let's go to field view and go to the event viewer, and we overlay all the strokes. What we'll see is we'll see that in this case, most of the strokes are full on this screen. But if we go, there's some gas interference. But if we go over here to this one, then if we and we overlay all these strokes, then yeah, the first strokes are empty, and then finally the last few strokes are full. And we see that the you know that we see a, a wide variety of strokes here. There's some full strokes. Another thing you might notice on this pump card is kind of interesting. The, the full strokes have a shorter stroke, and the pumped off strokes have a longer stroke. And that's what we call over travel because the plunger velocity profile changes when the pump's not full, and it tends to cause the plunger to move deeper in the barrel on the downstroke, and often it'll tag because you space the well for a full card. And then it'll move deep and tag on when it's when it's pumped off, or has incomplete pump fillage. And so this one shows the average pump fillage around 74 inches. And this one has a, a decent size uh, casing, and we could run a large size gas separator in the well. And this one has a high percent oil, but it's only making 20 barrels of oil. So why is it only making 20 barrels of oil? So if you go look at the if you go look at the the pump card analysis, and you look at the pump displacement calculation, and you select a representative strokes. So let me let me pick the right stroke. Let me go to the details view, and I'm going to pick a stroke that's not full. Let me pick one of these strokes right here, about half full. If I go to the pump card analysis, and I adjust the pump stroke on based on based on uh, runtime, then it's only running about 50% of the time. Now our production rate from this well is is stock tank stock tank is 29 barrels a day compared to 20, and so it's it's likely that when we collect this data on the well, the operator is running the the well on on pump off control and only running 50% of the time but still the pump fillage is, is is well hold on there's there's 29 barrels a day and that's with adjusted to gas and slippage but even even then when it's on pump off control or, or a clock it still has less pump fillage than what we're showing here um, which is which is we didn't we didn't get the representative stroke that's what I'm trying to say all these strokes here have more more pump fillage Calculated, adjusted, than what they're allocating based on the on the tank, on their uh, test. 20, 20 reported versus adjusted twenty nine on this stroke. The strokes average even less than this. So that's that's actually the last the last example here. Again, we we're, we're talking about gas separation. Uh, a large separator would probably help this well, and help allow you to draw the fluid level down, and have a have fuller have fuller a fuller pump. Um, I don't think they have a gas separate in the well. 
So with that, I think we're finished. So guys, I appreciate you all staying. You can finish it up, Carrie Ann. Yeah, we really appreciate you guys staying. I know for me, it just helps to see the TAM examples along with it. So um, if you do have any follow-up questions or anything else that you wanted to ask Lynn, please let us know and we'll be happy to, to get back with you. Otherwise, uh, next week's session is going to be about plunger lift and tracking your plunger and how knowing where your plunger is located in the well will help you optimize your plunger lift wells. So we'll get some information out about that, but we sure appreciate you guys and you're, you're what makes these sessions fun for us. And so we hope yeah. you have a wonderful day and a great week and we hope to see you next Wednesday. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.